Hey everyone, it's me HawkeyeG here, and today we're coming up with another Campaign Basics video. This time I'm just going to focus on the Campaign Map View. Hopefully this will be a good introduction to people who first open up the game, but they don't really understand what they're looking at. Um, so to begin, we're going to kind of look at the different things you're looking at on the map. So let's start with the most basic, right? You can see here, this is my territory, so I'm playing as Etain. Uh, you don't really have a specific indicator to know that it's your territory. You just have to recognize the faction that you're that you're playing as. You can see if I hover over it, it says your army on Tyrion, and here it says your province capital. So I can tell that this is my territory. There's a flag attached to the city that shows me which faction it belongs to. So I can identify this flag with my flag in the top right here, and that's how I know that these are all my settlements. Now. If, I, if you notice the little wings that are on the flag here, that's how you can tell that that's the faction's capital. So you can see here is Kalidor's capital, and here is Safari's capital. Now interestingly enough, Safari's capital is technically not the capital of the province, right? It's this Torfinu settlement. Now why that is, I'm not going to try to explain, um, but it's just a minor detail. If you're going to set up a trade route with somebody, you need to have a, a route that essentially connects your capital to theirs without any other cities or obstacles in the way. Um, your cities and their cities not including. So this is, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter a lot, but it's just a little, little detail so you understand what you're seeing there and why you're seeing it. Um, you can also see the title of the settlement. Obviously, that's not as big of a deal. But then next to it, you've got this little circle, and that is a different color depending on whether the climate is suitable, unpleasant, or uninhabitable for you. Now, the worse the climate is for you, the more penalties it'll incur on you, but that's something to kind of review perhaps in a different video um, to understand that better. But just know that this is a very simple, at-a-glance um, solution to show you whether this is like really good territory for you to control, or moderate territory with some penalties, or territories that really you shouldn't control unless it's for a really good reason, like it's the only stuff you have left on the map, or you need to kind of exterminate the last vestiges of an enemy that you've been fighting that you don't want to deal with anymore, stuff like that. So let's take a look at a couple examples. So you can see here, I've got some territory up here. It's a different climate, but it's still suitable for me. However, over here, I also have some climate that's uninhabitable. You can see there's various penalties associated with it, but the reason that I took hold of it is partly to eliminate an enemy that was present there, and partly just to solidify my hold on that territory. There's also the in-between of the unpleasant climate, which you can see by the yellow circle. Now, the picture inside the circle tells you which type of climate it is, uh, but that doesn't really matter much, um, maybe for use in co-op campaigns or, or just kind of having the general information to know like where, because, because these things change, the suitability of climate changes between each faction, even, even different high elf factions will have different climate suitabilities. So it's good to kind of have a general idea of what types of climates exist in what places. Um, but the most important thing is to know at a glance, you can see this little circle here next to it that tells you whether it's suitable climate for you or not. The next piece is these little symbols located next to it. Now you can hover over it to tell you, and it'll tell you what it is, um, but this one actually has all three of the typical ones that you'll see here. So if you see this little anchor symbol, that means that there's a port there. This building, the docks, will always be here. It gives you growth and a good amount of income, and you can't remove it. It's a good way to identify, again at a glance, what kinds of cities have a dock and what don't. So like this province here, it looks like both of these cities are right on the water, and they actually are. And if I zoom in, I can see that there's a port attached to each of them. It's kind of strange that it doesn't show it when you're totally zoomed out. Um, but like, it just, it helps you to identify that whether a city is really on the coast or whether it just looks like it's near the coast, whether you can directly get onto the water from it or not. And again, of course, it will have this building, which is a good building, but it restricts you from creating other things in that slot. Another symbol you'll see, and you'll see all kinds of different ones, is this final symbol. So like here we have wine, and here we have pottery, and here we have 
dies. Here we have exotic animals. There's a large number of examples of this, and you can see plenty of them on the screen at this time. These are all going to be special resource buildings. Depending on the faction and the, well, depending on the race that you're playing as, they will have different effects. So for some races, they'll give you money. For some races, they just give you the trade resource. They might also have additional bonuses like recruitment rank increase or recruitment cost reduction, etc. But the main purpose of these buildings is to be used in trade. I can, once I have this exotic uh, animals resource production, if I establish a trade agreement with another faction, it automatically will export my exotic animals and all my other resources to any factions that don't have them in order to make money off of it. So when you see this little symbol, when you see a mystery symbol like this, again, they can be all kinds of different resources. That indicates that there is some kind of rare resource there for you that you can collect and ultimately sell to other factions, and it may have some additional bonuses depending on the race that you're playing as. The last symbol to touch on is this little pillar, this monolith icon. Strategic location, it says. That means that this location should have a landmark category type of building for you that you can produce. These are always going to be like very specific buildings that have a very specific purpose. So here in Lothern, you can see I have the strategic location marker here, and I have actually two landmark buildings or two you know unique buildings, but one of them is the port, so it kind of occupies both slots. But you can see this is different than a normal port. It has different stats and different abilities. I also have this landmark building, the Court of the Phoenix King, which isn't available anywhere else. And in many cases, even if a different faction takes over this territory, they may not have access to this particular building. So it's something to keep take note of. Uh, you can see there's also one here in the Shrine of Asurian, right? Again, the landmark building category. These are usually very powerful buildings with very significant effects. They're also usually quite costly. And to try to detail all the different types of them that there are would be another video in and of itself. But just know that that's what that means. It usually means that you would want to capture it for your faction, if that's at all possible. Um, however, it doesn't always work. As you can see here in the Awakening, we have the strategic location building, but we do not have it available to us because of the faction that we're playing as. Um, sometimes the game just works that way. I don't actually have an explanation for that. I know that if I was playing as the right race, like the Vampire Coast, who would originally own this, they would absolutely have a landmark building in here. Sometimes there will be different text that will say this location may contain, uh, this location, there you go, special importance to, and it will name a specific race or races. And that is how you know for sure that as your race, you can go there and there will be a correct landmark building there. Um, otherwise, it's just kind of indicative of what are some strong points for the different factions that you're playing as, right? I mean, you can see here the Ziggurat of Dawn. This one's not lo this one's not uh, named as being for a specific race, but I still have the landmark building available. It, it's it's partly an indicator of valuable territory for you to claim. It's also just an indicator of valuable territory for the enemy that you might want to focus on, or at least make sure that you you know make sure you build up for properly before trying to attack because it might be stronger or they might be more willing to defend it. Now that we've talked about all the symbols that you're going to see on the map and next to a settlement, let's talk a little bit more about how to understand what territory you can control and what you're looking at when you see things on the map here in general in terms of terrain. So if I zoom out a little bit, you can see there's lines drawn that kind of divide places and it's kind of hard to see with the actual uh, with the cities set on top of them and maybe this will help give a clearer picture but the point is there's different provinces right if i click on lothern it brings up the etain province right and that contains all four of these settlements in it when you control all four cities in a province, it allows you to enact a commandment, which gives you special bonuses depending on the race that you're playing as. Again, kind of a separate thing. But so if I zoom out a little bit, you can see it says Etain here, 
the name of the province and then it's kind of got these borders drawn on the map to indicate where the edges of it are. And in fact, if I come back and zoom in, you can see those lines actually appear on the map as well. This is also a good way for you to determine where the line between your territory and your opponent's territory is, right? Uh, because you can replenish troops in your territory, you can recruit troops from eligible buildings in this entire province. Any, any military buildings I have in this province that allow for unit recruitment, I can recruit troops from any city or any zone in this province. However, if I step over the line into a different province, now I'm using that province's unit recruitment pool. Or if I step over the line into my opponent's province, then I don't get replenishment and I can't recruit units there. Okay, again, hovering over these things can tell you a lot of information that you might need to see. And so this helps determine if you're not sure or you're having trouble finding the dividing line or the colors aren't quite right, then you can see who, what territory belongs to who or where you're located. Speaking of that, you notice there is this yellow outline here and that's a little bit of a, it, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to make out, but the border, the color of the border indicates the status of that territory. Yellow means this belongs to me. Everything within this yellow border is my territory. White indicates a neutral border. However, if I were to declare war on someone, you will see that border changes to a red color. In addition, you can see that if I have a defensive alliance with someone, or a military alliance, or even they are my vassal, that border will be blue. So using these little border lines can kind of be a quick at a glance indicator of what kind of uh, board, like when you're, when you're kind of closed in on a province and you're moving your units around, it helps you identify what kind of borders you're approaching. One other little feature to notice on these cities is this little face here. That gives you a general idea of the relations that a faction might have with you, but you can tell more specifically by hovering over it. You'll also see little symbols that give you indications of other agreements. So you can see obviously the green face means they're happy, but if I hover over it, it gives me the details on just how positively or negatively they, they look at me. Depending on how high or how low that number is, you might hit certain thresholds for various things. The higher this number is, the easier it is to form different agreements with somebody, like trade agreements, non-aggression packs, or military access. And if you see this little flag icon, like we do here, that means that I can pass through their territory without them disliking me for it. Over here you can see I have a defensive alliance, and that is indicated as well. It actually replaces the face so that you kind of know, hey, we're probably fairly secure. It's pretty unlikely for the AI to break a defensive alliance, but that's because you suffer severe penalties for doing so in terms of your trustworthiness, uh, denoted by your diplomacy in this reliability rating. Again, a separate topic, but that's that's what you're kind of, that, that's why this gets replaced is because if you have a military or a defensive alliance with somebody, you're, you're not really meant to break it you're gonna suffer severe penalties. On the other hand, when you see somebody's relationship with you go negative, the further negative it goes, the more likely they are to declare war on you unprompted. And when they are at war with you, you'll actually see this little red crossed swords indicating that they're at war with you. Again, you can also see that their borders are red, even if they're not directly next to your borders, because you can see we have the white outline here for the neutral border of this person I'm not at war with and the red border of them that I'm at war with. Now since I own this territory and technically it considers me to be controlling this, like like the mountains here are technically part of this settlement. That's why you see that coloration on the map. That's why you see that outline of it here. Now we can't see much of the outline here. And this is what I was talking about with Hovering over can be a good way to tell what's your territory and what's what's not. You can see the lines right there. Um, but nobody can walk in that territory, so it's kind of irrelevant. Um, but just to give you an idea of what you're looking at. In fact, that's something that we can't see from this menu, but from the diplomacy menu, we can get a better idea of why these what these colors mean, right? You can see it uses those same colors in the diplomacy menu. 
Yellow indicates territory that is owned by whoever is selected. And then red is, the rest of it is just the relations or the view they have. So green means they're favorable towards you. Red means it's unfavorable towards you. So it kind of correlates with these little outlines you see representing whether it's your territory or an allied territory or neutral territory. The last piece I want to show in this video is the, low, the display that you see when you hover over a city like this. You can see that there's a number of values displayed below it, and if you hover over them, it'll of course tell you what they are, but I'll explain these in greater detail. First one is pretty simple. This is the total income of that settlement. Now, you'll notice that that's different than the number over here if you click on the settlement, right? The display you have here is a little bit different. But what we're seeing here is the income from that city specifically. Now, you can actually see this on enemy cities as well. So it's a good way to determine the value of a province that it has, or the value of a settlement for each enemy that they have, as well as, like, you know, should I go here and attack this or this if I want to make more money off of it, or perhaps if I'm attacking them to take money from them by sacking the settlement, it helps make that determination. The next, dis the next thing you see on the display is the public order. This is the same value as the entire province. This tells you essentially how satisfied people are with your rule. Uh, it's, that's what it means lore-wise, but you know, in the game that's not exactly how it functions practically. Uh, it's just a number that goes up or down based on various factors and penalties. Um, again, probably a different topic for a different time, but there's there's factors that can raise it, there's factors that can lower it. Most of the factors that raise it are buildings, most of the factors that lower it are either special events that happen or just by charging them taxes you have that base penalty. Higher difficulties have an increased base penalty as well. Uh, and then corruption can do it, which is the next thing that we'll talk about. But this is just allows you to, at a glance, if I hover over, I can see, hey, this province, maybe I need to send somebody there. Public order is decreasing. That's what that down arrow means. I can see that it's red, which means it's below 100, or it's below zero, because it goes from negative 100 to 100. At 100, it's maximized. There's different effects that it'll have on the province as a result. These differ for, by race. But so it's just something you can see at a glance by hovering over a settlement in the province. The next thing is corruption. Again, the display on each settlement does match the display for the entire province. Corruption is a mechanic in this game that determines the control. It, 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 has, various, it has various aspects of it. Um, as it says here, it affects public order, and different races have different types of corruption, right? The vampires, I think, are perhaps one of the easiest ways to understand it. The vampires have vampiric corruption, which means that you know, they're, they're undead, right? They're the forces of undead. They take attrition, their armies take damage in human territories because those places are full of life. They're not conducive to the undead, and vice versa. If you go into vampire territory, that's the realm of the undead. There's nothing to sustain life there, and thus your forces take damage. So this little indicator tells you what your corruption levels are and what the factors are on it. So like we saw over here, this province actually has some corruption, and that's due to some of the characters that are in the province that are spreading it. Uh, however, they do have multiple uh, characters spreading untainted. That's just kind of the general, like, human or, like, nondescript, um, just general, like, for, for all of the races that don't have a specific corruption of their own that they would want to spread to influence other people and, and hurt their public order. That's what untainted is. It's, it's lack of corruption, right? And so that's something you can increase with buildings, with characters of your own, and it's default for most of the settlements as well. You can see that uh, local populace. So depending on the native inhabitants of that land, you're going to have different kinds of corruption factors there, depending on the race or the faction that originally inhabited it. It also shows you how, like, whether the the corruption is getting better or getting worse. You can see on this readout, if I hover over it, what the current balance is of untainted versus corruption and what the values are trending towards. Um, 
the value that it's trending towards it's supposed to reach after i believe it is 10 turns so it'll you can see here like by my mouse cursor it says plus two percent so the chaos corruption is not going to increase to 40 percent on the next turn it's going to increase to 21 percent right so it's at a rate that it'll get there in the next in, in 10 turns from now so that's how you can see these, and you can see the minus 2% on the untainted. So again, just a quick little readout that tells you how's the corruption doing. Is the corruption affecting your public order? You can see if I hover over here, minus 4 from corruption. So you can see that display from there. The final feature here is this garrison size. This just tells you how many units total are in that settlement. So like this army has 17 out of 20 units. It doesn't tell you what type of units they are, so maybe they're all low tier units, or maybe they're all high tier units. To find that out, you might have to click on the settlement and then go to the second tab on the settlement readout page here, and you can see all the units for yourself. You can hover over them directly. You can also see that simply by hovering over the building that um, that produces that like establishes them in the garrison. This can be kind of tricky because sometimes special buildings like this, you can see at the bottom on the left there, it says provides garrison of a couple extra units. Um, there's also defensive structures that you can create. And if I can find one here, those will also add units to the garrison. So you can see like a typical settlement for me at max at level three only has seven troops in it, right? But a settlement with a defensive building in it is going to have 13. So it's just a way to tell at a glance for both yourself and for your opponent whether there's, you know, a defensive structure and reinforcements in that settlement, whether there's special buildings that are contributing extra forces to it, or whether it's relatively undefended and easy to take. Again, it tells you just at a glance how many units in there. It does not tell you the quality of them, so you might have to get get it within your visual range and actually look at this page to see what units are in it. But just, again, to give you a general idea of, you know, if I go to one spot versus the other, am I going to bump into defenses that perhaps I wasn't prepared for or additional forces that I didn't anticipate having to fight or additional defenses? So I think that covers everything that I wanted to cover in this video. I wanted to get a video that just covers everything that you can see, right? The basic visual aspects when you're looking at the campaign map, what kinds of things you're looking at, what kinds of things you can see, and what all this information is supposed to mean to you so that you can understand it at a glance and understand how to act on it effectively. Uh, I hope that this helps people out there. If there's any aspects of this part of the guide that you think I might have missed, or if there's any comments that you want to add about things that we're just initially seeing on the campaign map view, please feel free to comment them in the, in the comment section below. With that being said, I hope you've enjoyed the guide. I hope you learned something from this, and we will see you on the next guide. Thank you. Have a good day.